presentation of the Orville Yankee Award. Uh, to tell us about uh, this year's recipient, I'd like to call forward Lewis Molnar. Lewis? Good afternoon. Uh, you'll have to put up with me. I've got a bit of a cold, so if my voice holds out, great. If it doesn't, we'll eat lunch sooner. Um, so it's my pleasure to have been asked to say a few words about Bob Blackshaw, who is this year's recipient of the Orville Yankee Award. So just a little bit of background on my relationship with Bob. He left me a message on the answering machine at the farm saying he was looking for somebody for a six-week job term and that he would like to talk to me. I was fresh out of university looking for a job, so I went to talk with Bob. The next day, he left me another message offering me the job. Who could say no to working on something called the Detect Spray Project? That six-week job turned into a 24-year and counting career at the Lethbridge Research and Development Center. I worked with Bob as a technician for 23 of those years until he retired. I have always been amazed by Bob's depth and breadth of knowledge. I consider him to be a mentor and a friend. So a little bit about Bob. So he was raised on a grain and livestock farm near Verdon, Manitoba. He attained his BSc at Brandon University, MSc at the University of Manitoba, and PhD at the University of Guelph. After working in industry with the Alberta Wheat Pool and DuPont Canada, Bob moved to Lethbridge in 1986 to accept a weed scientist position with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. During his career at the Lethbridge Research Centre, Dr. Blackshaw conducted research with the goals of furthering adoption of conservation tillage, developing more diverse cropping systems, and devising new integrated approaches to weed management. Bob has published 250 scientific papers and co-edited a book on novel weed control strategies. His expertise was utilized internationally by the Canadian International Development Agency in developing dry land cropping systems in China and by FAO in setting environmental monitoring criteria for genetically modified crops. Dr. Blackshaw's contributions have been recognized by receiving the Excellence in Weed Science Award and a Fellow Award from the Canadian Weed Science Society plus the Outstanding Young Weed Scientist Award, Outstanding Research Award, and a Fellow Award from the Weed Science Society of America. So the Orville Yankee Award is a memorial award named in honor of one of Southern Alberta's earliest and most ardent soil conservation leaders. Medicine hat farmer Orville Yankee played a pivotal role in founding both the Southern Alberta Conservation Association and the Southern Al Applied Research Association the two organizations that merged in 2012 to form Farming Smarter. Since 2009, Farming Smarter has presented the Orville Yankee Award annually to celebrate a farmer or researcher whose contributions have significantly impacted soil conservation research and extension in southern Alberta. This award was previously given to Ron Zvains, Ike Lanier, Rob Dunn, Ron Howard, Ross McKenzie, Don McLennan, Don McLennan, Rick Swihart, Richard Fritzler, and Don Wentz. It is my pleasure to present the Orville Yankee Award on behalf of Army Smarter to Bob Blackshaw. Bob's just going to get a mic on and then he's going to share. Uh, I think you're ready to go. So once again, let's congratulate Bob Blackshaw. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, this is indeed a very special day for me. Um, I want to thank the, uh, the selection committee uh, for choosing me to be the award winner this year. And, um, and it was really special to have Lewis uh, come up and say a few kind words about me. Um, you know, Lou, Lewis said how, how he started uh, with me, um, but probably, you know, what he really didn't say is that, you know, we worked together for all those years and, and we were friends uh, 
for all those years, and uh, and it was a very good uh, working relationship. And I think we accomplished a lot over the years, and uh, and Lewis will continue to uh, to accomplish a lot and and work for my replacement, Charles Geddes, at the research station. So um, yeah, as and I guess the other thing I would say is that uh, you know Lewis mentioned that I I have been fortunate enough to win some other awards um, in my career. But I will tell all of you today that I think this is the most special one. Um, and the reason is, is it becomes, because it's local. It, it comes from you. It comes from the people that I've worked with um, over the past 30 years. And, uh, and for that reason, um, it is very special to me. And uh, I will always remember that. So. So now um, I'm going to uh, give a brief presentation. I was asked to say a little bit about my uh, career. And so I'm, I promise I'll keep this short and hopefully I won't bore you too much. So sometimes I've been asked about how did I become a scientist? Why did I choose to become a scientist? And, and I would say that um, you know, I didn't always want to be a scientist. I, I don't think I even knew I could be a scientist. Um, and it's sort of something that evolved over the years. Uh, I was raised on, on a farm in, near Verdon, Manitoba. And then uh, after high school, I decided to go to Brown University. And uh, while I was there, I, I really enjoyed all my science courses. I, I enjoyed learning and, uh, and I was just curious about uh, a lot of different aspects of science and biology. And um, near the end of my degree, I uh, took a summer job um, with the Agriculture Canada Research Station in uh, Brandon. And, um, and that was probably the pivotal moment um, in my life to do that. So um, I was fascinated by, uh, by the work that was being done there, um, all the interesting things that were being done. And I realized that um, you know, it was an opportunity to combine my interest in science and uh, my love of agriculture at, at, into one, one aspect, you know. And uh, so I was fortunate to work with two great people, Dr. Ken Campbell and Dr. Bob Wolf. And uh, I pestered them with a lot of questions and spent a lot of time with them. And um, they were very encouraging and, and, you know, they sort of suggested, like, you know, you could maybe do this. And, and I thought, well, wow, like, you know, maybe I could do this. So, um, so as I said, that was sort of a, a point to get me maybe in going on to uh, graduate studies. And uh, Ken Campbell, he, uh, he phoned up the University of Manitoba, uh, helped me arrange interviews uh, for graduate studies, and, um, and then away I went. So, um, and then I was very fortunate to be accepted into a master's program with Elmer Stoby um, at the University of Manitoba in a weed science program. And uh, he, he was a great mentor and, and taught me a lot. And uh, so I thank him a lot. And then uh, later on at University of Guelph, um, Jack Decker was my supervisor. So Chris and I moved to Lethbridge in 1986 uh, to start my job at the Lethbridge Research Station. And I want to acknowledge uh, Chris is here with me today. I um, want to thank her uh, for all of her love and support over the years. So um, we, we both grew up in Manitoba. We lived in Calgary for a while. Then we moved to Guelph to do my PhD. Um, but when we came to Lethbridge, we were really hoping that this would be our home. Um, I'd been bouncing around from one place to another, working here, working there, going to school. Um, and so we were really excited to come to Lethbridge. And, and it quickly became our home. We made many friends here. Um, our children were all born here, went to school, went to university here. And, um, and we very much look forward to our retirement here. Um, we're not going to move to BC like everybody else is doing. <laughs> um, so I want to thank uh, all of you uh, for your support and friendship over the years. So uh, it's been a great place for us. And, and we're happy to stay here. Now, Lethbridge Research Station. I uh, was hired to conduct weed control research in field crops, um, and that, that was great. Um, but very early on, uh, Dr. Wayne Linwall uh, grabbed me and, um, 
and told me that I needed to do some uh, work in weed control and conservation tillage systems. That you know they've done quite a bit of work in some of the tillage implements and harvesting, but there was a, a real need uh, for weed management and conservation till. And uh, he took the next step and um, went to the director at the time and um, convinced him that indeed, okay, this, this was something that Bob should be doing. And uh, I ended up with a joint, uh, joint appointment between the crop science and the soil science sections. And, and I think I was the only scientist ever at the research station to have that type of joint appointment. Um, and he did that so that I could work in conservation till and get, and get credit for it at the same time. So, uh, so I thank Wayne for, for doing that. I also want to thank a lot of other uh, people that uh, took me under their wing and introduced me to uh, the farm community in southern Alberta. And, and you'll see some of their names there. Certainly, certainly in the early days, Blair Roth, I, I just you know, talked to him at the coffee break there. Um, Blair Roth, Blair Shaw, Don Wentz, those type of people uh, were incredible. They uh, took me to meetings, they introduced me to people, um, and, um, and they helped suggest uh, what research I should be doing to help out farmers in southern Alberta. And certainly, when it comes to conservation till, we all knew there was a need for change. Um, and uh, I was very excited to, uh, to be part of that. So one of the first projects that Wayne got me involved in was uh, reduced tillage fallow. And uh, we still had 25 million acres of fallow at that time, so this is in the, the mid to late 80s that I'm speaking about. Uh, we knew there was lots of problems with fallow, um, but we weren't quite at the stage that we could, that we could move to continuous uh, cropping. Um, so um, we were really aimed at a bit of a compromise. Okay, if we're, we're still having fallow, what can we do that would be a less negative impact uh, on the environment um, in, a, in a fallow situation. Certainly the Noble Blade was widely used at that time. I'm sure all of you know that implement. But even when you use that implement, there's not a lot of ground cover left after three, four, five tillage operations to coronal weeds. And, uh, and Roundup was still very expensive at the time. As you know, Roundup didn't go off patent until the early 90s, so, so it was really prohibitive in cost in terms of using it in a big way on fallow. So our intention was to, uh, to come up with a combination of herbicides and tillage uh, where we could get good weed control, but, but that it would be affordable so people could actually uh, use that. And uh, so Wayne and I devised a very large experiment I think we had about 30 treatments in that experiment, and um, and I must say most of them were failures. Um, I remember one uh, particular uh, field tour that we had. We had about uh, 75 people come through and a couple of bus loads of people, and um, and one one individual took me to task at the time and uh, and said, uh, you know, these are the messiest plots I've ever seen, and. Uh, it's an embarrassment to see this on a government research station. And, uh, you know, he, he was right in one aspect. I mean, it was a mess. And we had weeds that were three, four feet tall, and they were flowering. And, um, and that was correct. But he was incorrect in another aspect, and that is that it's our job to fail at a government research station. And, and that's because if we fail, and hopefully there will be less failure on the farm um, when we make our recommendations. So, like lots of other things, I'm sure you've heard that plant breeders throw away 99% of all of their crosses, um, and they get one good one and they're happy. We were sort of happy to come up with one good treatment out of 25 or 30. And this is um, one of the, our winners. So uh, what we did is we had uh, fall 2,4-D was applied to control flixweed and stinkweed, the winter annuals. And then we came along with spring rustler, which was uh, glyphosate and dicamba in those days. And that took us through until probably the end of June, early July. And then we came in with a noble blade and uh, did an operation there. 
And so in this picture, you'll see, you'll see by the crop in the background, we've got through here until probably the middle of July, late July, um, and we've got excellent weed control, and we still have pretty good ground cover to prevent wind erosion. So, so this was a pretty successful treatment. So I want to acknowledge that the, the you know, people at Swift Current Research Station were, were working on the same aspects at the same time and we collaborated together. But uh, what ended up here is this treatment or some variation or combination of this treatment was used on millions of acres of fallow for the next uh, number of years um, until Roundup became cheap enough so that we could go to complete chem fallow if we wanted to go that way. So uh, it was one of our early success stories. The other thing I got involved in uh, was management of uh, some troublesome weeds as we moved into conservation tillage systems. And uh, one of the first projects that I worked on was downy brome. Uh, we knew that winter wheat was a good fit for uh, no-till, but uh, downy brome was a pretty severe problem and uh, enough to actually discourage some growers from going in that direction. I was fortunate enough to uh, attain some funding through the Farming for the Future program uh, to look at downy brome. Um, and uh, I remember that day uh, quite well because uh, it was the first outside funding I'd ever received and, and I received a significant amount of money for four years, uh, which was tremendous, uh, to go and, and try and come up with some management strategies uh, for downy brome. And, and we had some successes. We had some things came out of that that we could go to meetings and we could recommend uh, to growers what they might do to manage downy brome. And so such things as the importance of a good rotation with a non-cereal crop that broke up the life cycle of the downy brome, but also put emphasis on using trefland or edge or post to get good control of downy brome in those non-cereal years. Uh, we looked at higher crop seed rates. Um, if you remember in those days, we probably seeded wheat at a, a bushel an acre. Uh, that was a very low seed rate. Um, but we showed that you could go to uh, higher seed rates of cereals uh, under a no-till system or a min-till system um, and get a good crop and that, and that would help uh, outcompete some weeds at the same time. And then we, and we looked at some other herbicide things as well. So that's one of the first projects there on Downy Brome. The other one was uh, foxtail barley. Um, it was a weed that uh, was reasonably well controlled when we were tilling our land, but as soon as we went to a no-till system, it uh, thrived. And um, I remember an interesting conversation I had with Ike Lanier in my office in, in the late 80s, I guess was it would be, and uh, he was having a big problem in his no-till fields, and, and we bounced around a lot of ideas in terms of what, what could be done, and um, I, I didn't really have any good suggestions and what to do, and the only suggestion that I had, um, and maybe a bit of a lame suggestion at the point at that time, was, well, you could go in and do some tillage in October and uh, just undercut those plants and, the, and then let frost do the rest of the damage on those plants. And I said, you know, it's a shallow root system, maybe shallow tillage might work, you know, you might, might try that if you were, if you were desperate. But, uh, you know, Ike sort of shook his head and, uh, you know, he was heavily into no-till and, uh, and, you know, I knew that probably wasn't going to happen, right? So, but um, interestingly enough, um, I saw Ike at a field tour the following summer and he sort of pulled me aside and, and he said, uh, Bob, I took your suggestion. And I, I, you know, I sort of looked at him and he said, well, yeah, I, I took out the noble blade and a couple of my worst fields and, uh, and I, I tilled them, and you know, he sort of smiled, and he said, uh, you know, it worked pretty well. And, uh, but he said, but I'm not gonna talk about it at all, okay, you know, so. <laughs> I said, okay, your secret's, your secret's fine with me, so we're not gonna talk about that. But that was a very clear message to me um, that something needed to be done to get some control of, of foxtail barley in a no-till situation. So uh, it was a, a couple years later uh, before I was able to attract some funding to be able to address that. Um, there happened to be some money profiled um, uh, when Don Mazankowski was our Ag Minister. Anybody remember Don Mazankowski and our Ag Minister? 
So he profiled some money for, uh, for no-till research um, in the early 90s there, and, um, and I was uh, happy, or happy and fortunate enough to get some of that money to look at foxtail barley. And again, it was a tremendous thing. I got money for five years, which again was sort of unheard of in those days, or even in these days, really. So what that allowed us to do is do a lot of really great work. So um, first of all, I had to find an area to go to that was uh, heav or, you know, reasonably heavy infested with uh, foxtail barley, but not so saline that it wouldn't grow anything. It wouldn't grow a crop. And so I uh, went out with people for several days, and we finally came across an area up in the Carmody, Carmody Champion area, and we rented 10 acres uh, for a five-year project. And we took a real shotgun approach. Um, we looked at seeding rate, row spacing, banded and fertilizer, crop rotation, in-crop herbicides, and then, and then the timing of pre-seed, pre-harvest, and, and post-harvest glyphosate. And then we tried all combinations of those things. Um, as I said, it was a real shotgun approach. We didn't know what would work or if any of them would work, really. Um, but we, we did come across some, some things that, that were very useful. Um, and, uh, and we were able to make some good recommendations to growers to manage that. So the scientific paper um, that was published on that research won the outstanding paper in the Weed Technology Journal that year. And, um, and it was touted as really the first scientific paper that outlined using a truly integrated approach to weed management. Um, and so, so I'm very proud of that paper. Um, and what came out of that has encouraged a lot of other researchers uh, to conduct IWM studies. And for all of us, it, it sort of meant that we could attract money, we could attract funding to continue on in integrated weed management research in the future. More recent research, um, other weeds that were problems in, in conservation tillage were storksbill and roundleaf mallow. Uh, we worked on those. Uh, there was a lot of work on herbicide resistant and hybrid canola. Uh, I've always worked on diverse crop rotations because I believe that's a cornerstone of sustainable production. Jim Moyer and I did quite a bit of work on cover crops. And, uh, and then in more recent years, uh, quite a bit of my effort was spent on weed resistance. Now in terms of extension, and this is probably where most of you will actually know me or know of me um, and I've always enjoyed doing extension and um, I'll say that my job at the research station was primarily research and we always didn't get that much credit uh, for doing extension in fact we had some management that said you shouldn't be doing extension we got Alberta Ag to do that we got industry to do that but uh, I never really believed in that um, and because I thought it was important, and, and I guess the other thing is I just really liked doing it. So I liked meeting people, I liked interacting with farmers and producers in the industry, and, um, and it was important to get the message out there, but it was also, I learned a lot from you guys, and, uh, and certainly what your concerns were, what your problems were, and, and that was very important because that drove my research program. Because if I knew, like Ike Lanier coming in and saying, fox still barley is such a good problem, you know, blah, blah, blah. Okay, well, I need to do something about that, right? So, so it, was, it benefited me hugely as well as hopefully I was useful to the industry as well. One of my uh, first things I got involved in was the Conservation 2000 Clubs. Uh, so who, who in the audience remembers Conservation 2000 Clubs? So actually there's more hands go up there than I thought there might have been. So th this concept was small local clubs um, where farmers would work with other farmers and they would share ideas with other farmers. And, and I think they were reasonably successful. Um, and, you know, when it was all about sort of no-till. And so, so these people were looking for information, these clubs, and, um, and they were looking for a speaker to go out to those meetings. And, um, and, and from the research station, it sort of ended up being me by default. Wayne Linwall had moved pretty much 100% into management by that time. Um, most of the slides and data I presented was Wayne's data, so I give him full credit for that. But I would go out to these meetings. Often, sometimes, you know, often, a lot of times, there was four, five, six, seven people in the room. 
and um, sometimes often on, a, on an evening or a weekend, and um, I would give my 20 minute, 30 minute presentation, and then we would just sit down and talk for another hour, an hour and a half. And, um, and I, I think I looked at my role in those years as sort of responsible cheerleader. I said, yes, it could be done. Um, you know, we figured out lots of things, but it's going to be difficult. There's going to be problems, and, and really the benefits aren't going to show up for three to five years down the road. So you're going to have to be persistent, and you're going to have to be stubborn. Um, but I must say it was maybe the most exciting time in my life because I knew something big was about to happen, right? So, so we were less than 5% no-till. But where are we now, right? So, I mean, it was, it was on, on, on the edge of that. And, um, yeah, and I was really excited to be in, involved in that. So, Then uh, you'll see the other organizations over the years. Um, when I was, I was asked to be a speaker at those meetings, I always tried to say yes and uh, happily said yes, I'll say. Um, and then, uh, in, in some cases, I was on the organizing committee of agronomy update for many, many years, and uh, the Southern Alberta Diagnostic Field School. That was largely driven by Ross McKenzie and Rob Dunn in the early days, um, but the research station was involved in that as well, and, uh, and I was always involved in that. And then, of course, uh, uh, Farming Smarter, uh, uh, like in meetings like today. So this is my last slide, and I just want to remind everybody um, but where we've been and where we are now and the changes that occurred. Uh, the most significant one in my mind is that fallow has been reduced by more than 90%. So um, it used to be our biggest land use. We had more fallow than we had wheat or any other crop. Our biggest land use in Western Canada was fallow. And now we grow a crop on that land instead of it being bare ground. So that's, that's incredible. That's hugely significant. So you should all pat yourselves on the back for that. And the other big plus that's happened is we have a much more diversified cropping system now than we did 25, 30 years ago. It used to be dominated uh, almost totally by cereals. Um, but now um, with, uh, with a lot of pulse crops being grown, and obviously the huge success story of canola um, that you all know about, we now have a much more diversified and a much more sustainable cropping system um, than we did 30 years ago. And of course we have crops like uh, corn and soybean that are they're moving in in a big way as well. So, so I realize that you know, my contributions to these changes are actually very, very small, um, but it's been fun and very rewarding uh, for me to be part of that story um, and uh, you know I, I feel happy about being part of it so so um, I'm going to end it there I just want to thank everybody again for your support and friendship over the years and uh, and I look forward to uh, still seeing you in future years at meetings and uh, if you're a curler I'm going to be a curling bond spills and all the rural communities in southern Alberta like I have over the over the recent years so so thanks again very much to, to all of you for this award Thank you.